We are so glad that you're with us today here at Meadow Park. This is a great place to be. And if this is your first time here, we wanna welcome you to Meadow Park. It's a great church filled with great people who worship an awesome God. And we'd love to have you join us every week and we'd love to get to meet, meet you and know you a little better. So I encourage you to go to meadowpark.org forward slash connect. Let us know that you're here. Uh, ask any questions you might have of us. We'd love to get back in touch with you. And again, get to meet you someday in person. A lot of things always happening at Meadow Park. This is our Live Love Week, and so we're trying to look for great ways to love people around us. That's everything from maybe you buy the lunch for the person behind you in line at the drive-thru, or, or maybe you know a neighbor that needs an extra hand in this time, and what are different ways we can do it with that. As a church, we're also collecting items for winter, uh, coats, hats, gloves, uh, also grooming items, uh, toothpaste, toothbrushes, soap. Uh, be a part of helping us live love as a church. You can bring those to the church next Saturday between 10 and 11 a.m. On the west side, there'll be somebody to collect those items. So please join us in being a part of Live Love. Hey, next Sunday, our live stream is gonna be happening and that's gonna be at 10.30 on Sunday mornings. So uh, please join us live at 10.30 or you can on demand anytime after that each week. And so great way to continue to connect with us in worship. Let's just ask for God to be a part of our service today and this time of worship. God, we welcome you today. We're so glad that you're with us. We know you've got great things for us in this day and we're excited for uh, just the ability to praise you, worship you. We give this time to you. In your name we pray, amen.
Well, today we conclude our series to and through looking at generosity and the kingdom of God. But before I get to the message, I just want to welcome everyone to our online worship. We've once again had to make a quick pivot as we've all been following what's been going on with COVID-19 in our nation, but also right here in Columbus, locally, our, our city and county health officials have just been asking us to do whatever we can to help stop the spread and to lower hospitalizations and to really help the healthcare systems and ultimately to save lives. And we believe uh, because of our love for our neighbors and our community, and of course, for all of us at Meadow Park, we wanna do what we can to live love in this tangible way to our community and move our services online for at least the next four weeks, possibly longer. And we'll be updating you again in December. Thanks so much for your flexibility. Thanks so much for continuing to stay engaged and supported. And uh, I'm just excited that we have the technology and that we've been planning already to move to a live stream of our service on November 29th, which is next Sunday. So that'll be a 10.30 a.m. service. Uh, that is, will be happening live right here in the room without uh, people sitting in the congregation. But our worship team, uh, myself and the pastors, we're gonna do a live service. And so I just encourage each and every one of you, if you are able to, watch us right at 10.30 so you can be watching live. And especially if you can watch on Facebook, that'll be fantastic because in Facebook, we can share easily. We can uh, make comments in the comment section, just like this morning. We'd love to know that you're here. Um, you can give a thumbs up or a heart, you know, that, that's kind of like saying amen or I agree. If I happen to say something funny, you can even put a, a smiley face. It's just a way for us to sense this community watching together, being together in the moment as we worship because we know God's spirit transcends uh, time and space and is there with us as we continue to move together as a church through this uh, crazy season, but we know that God is with us. Well, today we wanna wrap up the series in part four, and I think today's message is gonna bring all of these different pieces together that we have been talking about. And uh, you know, we began the series just looking at this idea of God's abundance compared to the scarcity mentality that we live in. And that God's abundance just wants to bless us. But we, we talk about not just being blessed, but we are blessed to bless others. That when we grow in that generosity and understand that our Heavenly Father is so generous, we can be generous with, with people all around us. And ultimately what we need to be most generous with is the gift of the good news to share with others, to live that out, to be the evidence, to share our story, to care for others. And so even as we've been doing this month, we, we want to put into practice living a generous life. And that's what Live Love Month is all about, to teach us and to remind us that a life of generosity is the way to go, is what God blesses. And so I just want to say thank you again for the, for the donations that you've been, been bringing in for a head, hands, and feet drive. You've been bringing in coats and scarves and gloves and mittens and, and uh, toiletries, and our bins are filling. And if you're wondering um, how are we gonna do that now as we're not gathering, the next Saturday, uh, uh, you can bring on Saturday the 28th from 10 to 11 at the church, just drive through. You can drop off um, any of your donated goods so that we can make sure those get to the people in need. And don't forget, you can also write encouragement cards and uh, donate to help us provide gift cards for essential workers at Mayfair Village and at Daniel Wright Elementary School. We wanna bless our community and just live love each and every day. Well, today, as we wrap this series up, I wanna talk about, um, again, a story from scripture that really helps us understand how God works. And the, uh, part four today is turning your not enough into more than enough. Turning our not enough into more than enough. Beginning with a scarcity mentality or wondering that we don't have enough. How does God do that? How does he want to bless us with more than enough? I think many of us, and I've heard this from other people, say we, we want to be generous. I want to be somebody who's generous, but I just don't have enough to do that. If only I had more money. And so, you know, I want to give to the church. And when I hear about tithing and giving and, and putting God first, I would love to, but I just don't have enough. I'm too in debt. Um, I've got bills to pay. I'm living paycheck to paycheck. I don't make enough. How can I be generous? And so the alternative is we, we hold on and we get tight-fisted. And we say, well, the, the way to have more is to just hold on to what I have. And you might have some more through that, but you're gonna be empty inside. And what God wants us to do is to experience the freedom of, of, of living generously. So how do we do that? And so today, what I wanna look at is we wanna, we're gonna look at God's economy. 
You see, God designed the world with a kingdom economy. He designed the world with a kingdom economy, quite different from the human economy. And the story we're going to look at today is going to help us understand how in God's economy, he takes not enough and makes it more than enough. And so let's pray and let's open our hearts to hear what God has to say. And uh, very physically, where you're watching, wherever you're at, if you just bow your head, and I want to encourage you to to actually open your hands as we pray as a sign of asking God's blessing and also asking him to allow us to be generous. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, as we've been talking about your generosity and your blessings, Lord, help us as we hear your word to release the tight grip on our stuff and our things and our money and to experience what a life of generosity can look like. And Father, how you can take our not enough and make it more than enough. Give us the courage today to trust you. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, the story we're going to look at today is a well-known story if you've been in a church and even if you haven't been in the church. We're looking at the feeding of the 5,000. The feeding of the 5,000, not just 5,000 people, but 5,000 families that Jesus and his disciples took care of. So let me share with you the context. Jesus and uh, his disciples were on, you know, they were getting together. The disciples had been on a, on a missionary journey. Uh, they'd been assigned to, to preach and to teach, and, and they'd been going around and doing that. And they were coming back together, and they were sharing stories. And they were talking about the amazing things that happened and you know what it is. You've worked hard. You've been gone on a conference for a few days. You've been you know, doing what you've been doing. And the disciples were tired. And they were ready for a break. And they were hungry, it says. They were ready to eat. And as they were in this, in this place, they were trying to get in the boat. And all of a sudden, crowds started crowding in. And as more and more crowds came, the people were demanding more of Jesus. And it says that Jesus looked on them. And he had compassion. And he began to teach them. And so here they are now, the disciples are hungry and the people are just sitting and taking in from Jesus and he continues to teach and he's giving them uh, these, these amazing words and the day is moving on. And as the disciples are noticing what's happening, we read about it in Mark chapter six and you can follow along in Mark chapter six this morning. And in verse 35, the day is getting late. They're hungry, they're tired, they're seeing the people and this is what they observed. It says, late in the afternoon, his disciples came to him and said, This is a remote place, and it's already getting late. Send the crowds away so they can go to the nearby farms and villages and buy something to eat. So they're looking at the people. They're having compassion on them too, and they're saying, Jesus, the people are getting hungry. We're getting hungry for crying out loud, and it's getting late in the day. Here's what we need to do. Just just send them away and and, and be done with this, and, and so we could all go home and so that they can eat. Well, here's the thing. Sometimes are not enough is just not enough. Sometimes there's just not enough. They, they didn't have enough energy left. They didn't have enough food left. They didn't have anything left. And, and we just come in our lives, we come to a point where we say, it's, it's just not enough. They're hungry. The people are hungry. You know, they saw the need and they wanted to do something about the need. And here's the thing, when there's not enough, they also had a plan. And they had a great plan and they wanted to share that plan with Jesus. Here, Jesus, look, there's not enough. We need to send them home. Here's how we're going to take care of it. And when I think about our own lives, and I think about times when we don't have enough, when we're struggling and we, we start praying, isn't it interesting that, that we always have a plan for how Jesus can solve our financial challenges? Don't we always have a plan? We have a great idea. Jesus, I know exactly what you need to do to help me in my financial challenges. God, help me get that new job with a better pay. Help me get that raise. Jesus, just, just you know, help me um, you know, come through with, with that tax return that's, that's bigger than, than I was thinking. And you know what? Our plan always tends to involve the human economy, the way things work in this world. In order to have more money, I need to go through channels that provide more money. But because we've heard stories like the feeding of the 5,000 and Jesus' miracles, we also pray for an amazing miracle. God, just produce more. Help me get this windfall or an inheritance that I didn't know was there. Or, or when I fix that, you know, the hole when the towel rack fell out of the bathroom wall and I'm fixing that, help me to find, you know, $20,000 that are stuffed in the wall. Lord, we have a plan. Do a miracle. Do something. You take care of it or get me out of this mess. But even when we have a plan, God has a different plan. 
Look at Jesus's plan. He throws them for a loop with his plan in Mark 37, chapter six, verse 37. But Jesus said to them, you feed them. That's Jesus's plan. You feed them. I want you to do something about it. He's looking at us and he's looking at the church and he's saying, yeah, there are needs everywhere. We're saying, Jesus, there are people that are hungry, that are starving. There are people that need clothing. There are people that are dying from COVID. There are, the hospitals are being overrun. Do something. And Jesus says, you do something. You feed them. You take care of them. Remember, we talked about it last week. God wants us to share in the joy of sharing the greatest gift. He wants us to be a part of that. You feed them. But what's our response? Our response is like the disciples. There's never enough. Look what they said here in verse 37. With what? They asked. We'd have to work for months to earn enough money to buy food for all those people. They're doing human math. They're looking at the human economy. They're looking at what they don't have. They see 5,000 families and they're looking at the 12 of them going, we didn't even have enough for our own dinner let alone for everybody else. How in the world are we supposed to take care of everyone else? You see, we do the math. Humanly speaking, those things don't add up. Humanly speaking, there's an exact cost for how much to feed 5,000 families. Imagine today you have to feed 5,000 families. And so the, and, and there would be 12 of us on staff. We'd be looking at each other and going, okay, um, how do we do that? Well, let's all get them $25 gift cards and send them to Chick-fil-A. Oh, except it's Sunday, they can't eat there today. So we'll send them somewhere else. Twenty-five family, uh, twenty-five dollar per family. Five thousand families. Man, that's one hundred twenty-five thousand dollars. That's over ten thousand dollars each. We'd have to work for months to to create that kind of money to feed them. So we understand Jesus's disciples. It doesn't add up as we look at the human economy. There's not enough. Sometimes there's just not enough. Jesus looks at them. And he says, how much bread do you have? Go and find out. Right? We focus on what we don't have. Jesus, is, Jesus focuses on what we do have. This is part of God's economy. He's saying, don't just look at what you don't have. Don't say, here's all the things you can't do. Look at what you have. Take a step back. Do an inventory. What's there? How many fish do you have? What, what's available to you? And this is what we do as people, that what God is calling us to do. He's saying, take an inventory. And as we head into this Thanksgiving week and we give thanks for so many things, thankfulness is a way that we do an inventory. We look around and we say, God, thank you for what you've blessed us with. Thank you for the good things in my life, for family and friends and church. Thank you for the material blessings that provide food on the table, that give us a roof over our heads and clothes on our body, that you've guided us through this year and kept us safe. And when we are blessed, we realize others that may be struggling, we can bless others, but he's saying, do an inventory. And I think about us as a church, and I think about our call to, to change the world and the community, to, to partner on missions fields, and to partner with local groups, and, and to do the ministry we have. And sometimes we look and we say, there's not enough. We need to, to cut the budget. We need to um, just hold on to what we have. You know, we want to make changes or maybe renovate the building or do some things. We go, there's just not enough. But God's saying, take an inventory. Imagine if we took an inventory of every person that calls Meadow Park home. If we all came in and said, here are all the assets that we have, the physical aspects, not even, not even counting our gifts and talents and health and strength and abilities. I mean, imagine how many cars are at our disposal. How, many, how, how much money is tied up in, in, in our assets of homes and, and properties? When we think about, you know, we have 500 lawnmowers or we have tons of clothes. I mean, the assets we have, we have more than we think. But we tend to focus on what we don't have. And Jesus says, what do you have? Take a look and come back. And says in verse 30, it says, for 38, they came back and reported, we have five loaves of bread and two fish. Five loaves of bread and two fish, 5,000 families. This is woefully insufficient. Woefully insufficient. And we look and we go, how in the world can we meet this need? The demand is too great. And it could have been so easy for the disciples just to say, see, Jesus, I told you there's not enough. At least we have enough bread and fish that maybe the 12 of us can eat. And uh, we, can, you know, we can be on our way. So here you go, Jesus, we proved our point. Send the people home. This is where many of us stop in our story. This is as far as we trust God. 
He asks us to do an inventory. We look around and we just come to the conclusion there's just simply not enough. And we stop there. And we miss the blessings of the kingdom of God, of God's economy at work and the way that he wants to work. And I love this, this next part. Because what, what God is asking then is, this is the second point here. Give it to Jesus. Surrender your not enough into Jesus's hands. Surrender your not enough into Jesus's hands. This is the turning point. This is where things change. We either say, I'm gonna hold on to my not enough or I'm gonna surrender it into Jesus's hands. And so what did the disciples do? They gave him the five bags of Wonder Bread and two filet of fish sandwiches and said, all right, Jesus, here you go. And wondered what would happen. This represented everything they had. And they gave it to him, they surrendered it. And, and when we look at God's economy, God's economy begins to work in our lives when we surrender to him when we trust our not enough into his hands. Instead of trying to say, only when I have more, God, then I will trust you. No, we begin to trust him with the little that we have. Now, the church is often criticized for asking about, uh, for money, talking about money, asking for the tithe and putting God first and 10%, how is that even possible? When we give and we practice generosity, it is one of the most spiritual things that we can do is one of the most incredible ways that we can grow spiritually because of the fact that we struggle so much with it, because of the fact that it's so hard, because we struggle to trust God that he will provide, that there will be enough. How could I possibly give up what I have? You know, there's this great story some chapters later in Mark 12 where Jesus is, uh, he's at the temple and you know what he's doing? He's actually watching the giving boxes. He's watching as people put money into the giving boxes and, and how they're responding and what's going on. And here's his observation. We read about it in Mark 12, verse 43. He says, I tell you the truth. And he watched this poor widow that put in some money. He said, this poor widow has given more than all the others who are making contributions. For they gave a tiny part of their surplus. But she, poor as she is, has given everything she had to live on. Jesus is looking and he's giving us a little lesson here between human economy and God's economy. Human economy says, who gave more? Those that gave out of their surplus, those that gave a lot. Here's this woman, she only put in two little coins. But in God's economy, she gave out of everything she had. And Jesus noticed that and he saw that and he honored that and he recognized that. And so what do we do with our not enough? Who do we entrust it? And again, we get stuck here. Because there's this hurdle of saying, I don't know that I can give up even what little I have. Can I trust God with the first part? Can I tithe? Can I give? I don't know. I don't believe God's economy works. When we don't tithe and give, what we're ultimately saying is we don't believe God's economy and his word works. A human economy is all that works. What is, is what is. There's one pie and there's so much of it. A dollar is a dollar is a dollar but we need to stand and be amazed and see what happens because here's what we need to understand. God can't bless what we don't surrender to him. God can't bless what we don't surrender to him. And when we begin with the tithe, when we begin with our first part, we say, here it is, God. We allow God to speak and bring blessing into the rest of our things and our finances and into our life. And so the disciples surrendered their not enough into Jesus's hands. But what happens next is something that, that um, is something that I never really was that conscious of before and paid that much attention to. And it, I think it's a real key piece here. See, Jesus didn't, didn't look at them when they gave them, when they gave them, you know, the, the bread and the fish and say, you know what? You're right. You're right. There's, there's not enough here. You did your job. You did an inventory. Um, we'll just grab this food. We'll, we'll head off and uh, send everyone else away. Because again, in a human economy, the way we look at it, that's what should have happened. But look at verse 39. Something amazing happens here. Then Jesus told the disciples to have the people sit down in groups on the green grass. So they sat down in groups of 50 or 100. You might look at that verse and say, I, I don't see it. What, what's the big deal? What's going on here? This leads me to the third point. Prepare for the miracle. Prepare for the miracle. Jesus hadn't done anything yet. Now we have heard the story. We know that the people get fed, but the disciples walking through this in real time at that point, they didn't know what was gonna happen. They just saw, here's Jesus. He's holding five loaves of bread and two fish. 
But what is Jesus telling them? Prepare for the miracle. Go out there now to these 5,000 families and start getting them into groups. Get them into groups of 50 and groups of 100. Imagine the disciples going, Jesus, what are you talking about? And Jesus is saying, we're going to feed them. And they're going, this doesn't make sense. They're preparing. Jesus is having them prepare for the miracle. Imagine the conversations around us. People are going, um, why are we getting into groups? Because uh, we're going to feed you guys. And maybe one person looks up and goes, I don't see enough food. I see five loaves of bread and two fish. Uh, what, what are you doing? The disciples had to trust Jesus. They had to prepare. They had to, to do what, what, what he asked them to do. And I wonder for us, are we willing to prepare in faith, in trust, that God's going to work in our lives, that he's going to fulfill his promise, that his blessing is going to flow through us when we entrust our first parts of our finances and our things to him? What are some ways that we, we prepare? We prepare by, by creating a resume. We prepare by maybe getting a new degree or a new certification. We prepare by, by moving and acting in what we believe God is going to do. We prepare and we, and we prepare for the miracle when we tithe. When we give the first parts, when we say, Jesus, I trust you with the first part of what you've given me and, and I'm gonna prepare for the miracle. I'm gonna believe that you're gonna provide and you're gonna take care and we act and we move in faith. That act of giving first is preparing for the miracle and showing and demonstrating our trust in God. So they give Jesus the fish and the bread. They get people into groups. And then we read in verse 41, Jesus took the five loaves and the two fish. He looked up to heaven and blessed them. Then breaking the loaves into pieces, he kept giving the bread to the disciples so they could distribute it to the people. He also divided the fish for everyone to share. They all ate as much as they wanted. Amazing miracle that they witnessed in front of their eyes. Jesus took what they brought him and he began to break it into pieces and they began to distribute it. The fourth point is this. Jesus turns our not enough into enough for me and you. This is God's kingdom economy at work. He's the one who takes our not enough and multiplies it to all of a sudden it's enough. It's enough for the disciples. It's enough for everyone that is there. And, and I'm still even processing this part that Jesus didn't just miraculously call from heaven for, for loaves of bread to start falling from the sky, like in the movie Cloudy with a Chance of Meatballs. Or he didn't just start having fish that were there by the sea start jumping out of the water and start you know, walking on their fins you know, to feed everyone, some kind of miracle where God produced something new. What did he use? He took the very thing that was brought, the not enough, and he took that and he divided it. He multiplied what was brought the fish and the bread. And he invited the disciples into the beautiful experience of, I want you to feed them. And I want you to experience what it means to be a blessing and to pass along what I have provided. I mean, think about this. This is, it is our blessing to distribute, to distribute bread, bread that we didn't take, break, bread that we didn't make, bread that we didn't bake. I mean, this is God blessing us and saying, I want you to be a blessing to others. I want you to be a part of sharing this amazing, this amazing blessing with others. I got to experience that in a, I got to experience that in a, in a small way this last, this last week. Um, I was, I was at home in the evening and I got a text and the text was from a person that I knew 25 years ago. Haven't seen them since then, really had no contact with them. And here's what the text said. It was, um, are you home? Can I bring by a check? That's kind of an odd text to get after you haven't seen somebody for 25 years and don't really have much context with. And I said, I'm confused. Are you in town? And check, I don't know what you're talking about. He said, when can I come? He showed up at 1030 at night, came to my door and handed me a check. And, uh, and he said, you know what? Um, I've been doing well in, in my business and I just have found such a great joy in sharing that with others. And it really just uh, makes me feel good to give to others. And sometimes people try to take advantage of that. And so, um, I've, you know, I know you're a pastor and I want to trust you with this to, to bless someone else. He said, if you need it, use it for you and your family or, or, or share that with somebody else. We talked for 10 minutes, caught up a little bit and he was on his way. And 
my wife and I got to start thinking, how do we want to use this to bless others? What a gift. Somebody brought us resources that we can now use to bless others. And so through the church and through our Live Love Fund and through our missions, we're going to distribute those resources. And I get to share with him how we are using that, his resources to bless others. Now, here's the thing. My, my friend, as far as I can tell, at this point in his life is not a follower of Jesus. And, uh, and it just goes to show, though, that these principles, because it's a kingdom principle, that God has wired into, the, into this world works whether or not you're a follower of Christ. Because the blessing that's there, the gifts that come when we are generous, God gives us and allows us to bless others. And so it was just so fun to see that firsthand and, and to just experience that generosity and, and getting to be a part of that. And so we, we shared that blessing and we give to others. But what we need to know is that when we give to God, when we put him first, we will never come up short. And I think that's the fear we have. We have the fear that, that, that if I give it, then, then in the end, I'm gonna end up with less. No, we never come up short. There was enough for the disciples and for others. There's enough for me and for you. And this story would be awesome. This story would be cool if it ended right here. And if that was the final word, what an awesome thing to do, to trust God with our not enough and watch him make it enough for me and you. But God in his abundance mentality, God in his abundance economy, God in his amazing and generous love does more. Read verse 43 and 44 with me. They all ate as much as they wanted. And afterward, the disciples picked up 12 baskets of leftover bread and fish. A total of 5,000 men and their families were fed. Here's the thing. It's not just that God takes our not enough and makes it more than enough. The fourth point is this. Jesus generously provides more than enough. Leftovers. And man, what a great message as we head into Thanksgiving. Leftovers. Who doesn't want leftovers from Thanksgiving dinner? I mean, it's great if we have a great feast, but the feast keeps on giving when we have leftovers, when we can send somebody home with extra when we can eat that turkey sandwich later on in the week and have some of those warmed up uh, mashed potatoes and green bean casserole and sweet potatoes with those marshmallows on top. Leftovers. This is God. This is Jesus and all of his beauty. It's not just that I'm going to provide enough for you and for others. I'm going to give you enough to go home. And how many basketfuls? Twelve. How many disciples were there? Twelve. Coincidence? I don't think so. I think Jesus was trying to show his disciples, you started with nothing. You did a little inventory and you still had not enough. But when you trusted it with me and when you prepared for that miracle, I provided enough for you and I want you to go home carrying these basket full of bread and fish. I mean, imagine the disciples uh, as, they're, as they're carrying these baskets. I can imagine the conversation just going, what an amazing day as they're talking with each other and going, man, we were so hungry. We were so ready to send everybody home and, and telling Jesus that. And then he says to us, you feed them. <laughs> that, was, that felt ridiculous. And then uh, he asked us what we had. And remember when, remember when Andrew and John came up and, and John was like, I, I got five loaves of bread. And, and, and Andrew came up and was like, I got two fish. That's, that was ridiculous. We're like, here, Jesus, what can you do with that? And, and, and they're just hearing the story. Remember when Jesus had us put everyone into groups of 50 or 100? How embarrassing was that? We didn't know what was going to happen. But they had a story to tell, an amazing story of how God took what they brought him and he multiplied it and he blessed them and he gave them more than enough. This is the story. This is God's kingdom economy at work. And when we can trust God in it, when we can be uh, in this mindset of abundance that he gives us and we can generously share, it's amazing what can happen. Look at 2 Corinthians 9 verse 8. And God will generously provide all you need. Then you will always have everything you need. And look at this. And plenty left over to share with others. Do we have the courage to trust God? Because here's, here's how it is all summed up today. Our not enough placed in Jesus' hands becomes enough. With even more than enough leftovers to share. This is the progression. And are we willing to trust God in it? Are we willing to walk with him? Are we willing to give him our not enough, our doubts, our concerns, our fears, and watch God's kingdom economy at work, inviting us to share in that blessing, to be a part of it, to share the miracle stories in our life and in our church? 
because this is how it works in God's kingdom economy. And when I think about this to and through principle, not only that God gives his blessings to us, but that he blesses through us. And the way we do through us is that we prepare for the miracle to watch what God can do when we are generous. So let me ask you, what step are you gonna take? How are you going to take a step in generosity? I wanna close with this verse in Isaiah 32, verse eight. But generous people plan to do what is generous and they stand firm in their generosity. Generous people plan to do what is generous and they stand firm in their generosity. Generosity is not just something that just happens to us. We need to plan to be generous. How are you planning to be generous? Now, throughout scripture, God's plan in the Old Testament and the New Testament was always a plan to put God first, to take care of his kingdom, to put treasure in his kingdom, to care for the temple in the Old Testament, to to provide for the church, to provide for the needs of others, the tithe, put God first. That is a step that we can take, a plan to be generous, a plan to say, I'm gonna provide in our Live Love campaign. I'm gonna, I'm gonna bring for the drive. I'm gonna buy coats. I'm gonna buy some toiletries. I'm gonna plan to be generous. I'm gonna plan to do good things. It's an intention. It's an active step we need to take. Can you plan to take a step up the generosity ladder? If you've never given, maybe you start to give and make the plan. I'm just gonna start with X amount of dollars or X percent. Or I'm going to raise what I give, one more percent. I'm going to be more generous. I'm going to plan to be more generous to causes that matter to me in the community. We need to plan to be generous, but we also need to stand firm in that generosity. And I think that's critical because so many times we make a plan. But as we know, once we make a plan for some sort of generosity or giving, it doesn't take long before the car breaks down, before uh, there's a hole in the roof that we need to fix before the money runs tight, before a new bill comes up, before the kids, you know, need braces. We need to plan. We need to plan to put God first and then we need to commit to say, I'm gonna stand firm in my generosity. And when we do, God will honor that. And we get to give him our not enough and generously give it and God will provide us in return more than enough with leftovers to share so that we can continue to be generous. As we close, I want to close in a word of prayer. And just like we did in the beginning, I want you to pray with open hands to receive the blessings to you, but also to symbolize to God, I want the blessings to flow through me to others. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for this amazing story that that just uh, taught the disciples and all who were there a new economy that showed them your amazing generosity to us, the abundance with which you uh, just want us to experience this world. Father, help us to overcome our fears, our scarcity, our tight-fistedness, our greed, our worry. God, give us the freedom to put you first, to open our hands, to be conduits of your goodness. And just as your word promises, God, you give us the seed to plant. You bring us the harvest. You allow us to be generous. God, may we be a generous people. God, thank you for the generosity that has been on display through Meadow Park for over 50 years. Blessing the city, blessing the world, giving generously to causes beyond our walls. And Father, even in this time, through our live, love um, drives and efforts, God, we pray that your blessings would flow through us and that we get to experience the miracle of your multiplying your blessings in our lives. And Father, ultimately, we thank you more than for the bread that we receive each and every day, but God, that you are the bread of life that sustains us, that gives us hope, that nourishes us in our souls. We are so grateful and so thankful. And Father, in this week of Thanksgiving, we just thank you first and foremost for your goodness and blessings in our lives. We commit ourselves to you as your generous people living love in this world. In Jesus' name, amen. I just wanna thank you for spending some time together this morning. And as we head into this Thanksgiving week, I just want to wish you and your family a a very happy Thanksgiving. Be thankful for the blessings of those around you. I'm so thankful for our church family and all that God is doing to continue to guide us. And I want to invite you back right here next week at 10.30 a.m. for our live stream 
as we begin a brand new series called God With Us. This reminder of God's presence with us through this time and, uh, and just the relationship that he wants with us as we begin our Christmas season together next Sunday. God bless.